Well, welcome to week three of our foundation series. And together as a congregation, we are uh, spending some time over the next few months looking at the foundations of what we believe, why we believe it, and, and with that, the identity that we have as a congregation and part of the larger body of Jesus. So last week, we looked at this idea of the triune God, this our God, who is one God, who exists eternally in three equal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we also took some time to consider God's attributes, some of God's attributes, that he is holy, just, and loving, and infinite, and holy, and worthy of worship. And from that time that we, we spent looking at these things together, we ended by taking the time to come into God's presence and ask the Lord to to hit us with a new fresh sense of how amazing he is. How amazing it is that even the infinite God would reveal himself to finite beings such as us. That we get to have a personal relationship with the almighty God. So that's what we spent our time on last week week. And this week, what I want to do is I w- we're going to continue in this thought train around the triune God. And my prayer today is that as we walk away, one of the things we're, we're going to gain from this time together is a better clarity of who the persons of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are. But before we get into that, I'd like to ask you to join me. Let's, let's stop. Let's pray. Um, The triune God is a beautiful subject, but it's a big subject, if anybody hasn't noticed that yet. So let's, um, let's ask God to just open our hearts, open our minds as we look at Scripture. Lord, thank you for uh, this morning. Thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Thank you that we get to worship together. Father, we just finished singing Blessed Assurance, and we have a beautiful blessed assurance in Jesus. God, we give you our praise and our glory. We thank you. Thank you for that. Lord, today, as as we look more at at who you are, even as we look more at the idea of salvation and how uh, you made that happen, how you saved us, Lord, I pray that you would open our minds and, and our hearts to receive from your word And Lord, that together as a body, we would be um, strengthened in our faith and empowered to go forth and proclaim the gospel. God, we thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I want to start this morning, and I'm going to make you work a little bit, because why not, right? Um, I want to, last week I I asked, like, how would you explain the Trinity? And I really appreciated so many people... um, Gave, a, gave some, some ideas or some ways to explain the Trinity. Thank you for that. Today, what I would, I'm kind of curious. I would love to hear some people describe how you understand the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit, or you can do all three. But would anybody be willing to just share? How do you, how do you understand uh, the persons of the Trinity? Yeah, that they're one. Right. Thank you. Well, I like to think about um, Jesus in the gospel and then he kind of taken on human flesh. He's praying. And why would God need to pray? And he did pray to the Father. And then he said when he was leaving on well, the Last Supper that the Holy Spirit would come and help us that he mm-hmm. might not forsake us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else have any any thoughts on that? I, it's okay if you don't. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing some of those things. Um, 
I was, I wanted to get an idea of how, how do we understand the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? How do you, how do you even relate to these, these three persons of the Trinity? And so part of what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the, the primary roles of, of each of these persons. Um, but I, I just kind of wanted to start and get that, get, get some ideas from you as well. I, I want to share this. It comes from our, uh, the, it comes from a, a commentary that was produced by our, our national fellowship. Talking about the Trinity, this idea of the Trinity, it says this, the doctrine of the Trinity is not a logical puzzle, but it undergirds the reality of salvation and our relationship with God. The doctrine recognizes God the Father reaching out through the Son and the Spirit to save the world out of love. So the main idea today, is, as we're looking at this again for the second time, is that salvation is the act of the triune God. Sometimes we get, we get a little bit caught up in, in, in a few different things. When we think about God the Father, sometimes we just, we accidentally relegate him to the Old Testament because he seems like, you know, maybe, maybe he's the angry one who's always judging people. And, and that can sometimes happen for Christians. Or with, with Jesus, we know very well that, that he's our Lord and he's our Savior, but then sometimes some false teachings can slip in there and they can start to distort our, our view of God the Son. And with the Holy Spirit, I find sometimes that we get a little uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit. We don't quite know what to do with him. And so we're just kind of like, oh, how do, I, how do I relate to the Spirit of God? This doesn't quite make sense. So as we work through the scripture today, the goal is to understand how God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all have a role in salvation and also even in, in creation and eternity. And what I do want to stress here at this point is we talked about the attributes of God a little bit last week. What we are not saying here is that, you know, maybe the Father has a few of those attributes and the Son's got a few and the Spirit's got a few. All three persons are fully God. All three persons have all the attributes of God. But they have different primary roles and they work together in, this, in, the, in harmony. And they, as, as, we, as we're going to talk about today, salvation is the act, not just of God the Son, but of God the Father and the Holy Spirit as well. So my biggest prayer this morning is, as we look at this, as we get into this, is that we will see how amazing it is that God the Father reaches out through the Son and through the Spirit to save the world. So let's, as we jump into this, let's start and let's, let's get a clearer picture of God the Father. As we look at this, I want to start, and I want to remind you, this foundation series, we're looking at our statement of essential truths, which is available for you on the back table if you'd like to take a look at it. But what we're going to be doing as we go through this series is we're going to look at the portion of the statement that pertains to whatever we're talking about. But then we're going to look at Scripture. Because our faith and our belief is not based on some document that was produced by whoever. Our faith is based on the Word of God. So that's where we're going to spend our time. But first, let's quickly look at our, at our we're, we're calling it the Soet for short. The Father accomplishes his plan of salvation through both redemption and judgment. All things will be subject to him, and his kingdom will have no end. That is what our statement of essential truth says about the Father. So, is that what Scripture says about the Father? Well, let's take a look at this. As I said, often we, we think of God the Father as the grumpy one who's, who's angry and, 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 you know, he's always, maybe you think of him as always bringing down fire or passing judgment on someone. And the reality is in Scripture is that we do find God's justice and, and God's wrath against unrighteousness and sin present, particularly in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament as well. 
but we also see demonstrated the Father's great love. So I want to turn our attention first to Exodus 6, verse 6. It says this, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. So what we see in this, in this one verse, just even one verse, is we see God accomplishing the plan to save the Israelites from slavery by stretching out his hand to redeem them and by these great acts of judgment. And as we read further in the book of Exodus, we see that God sends the ten plagues to um, the Egyptians. But through these judgments, God does two things. One, he frees his people. Two, he brings just judgment upon the Egyptians, but he doesn't totally destroy them or totally wipe them out. Instead, he allows them to see the power and might of the living Yahweh, the living God. And this becomes an opportunity for them to repent and to turn to him. And for the most part, as, as far as we know, most of Egypt did not do that. But some did. Some chose even to go with the Israelites when they left Egypt to claim the one true God as their own. And God's power and might was put on display and demonstrated, but within that is his love and that people have the option to repent. Romans 1, 16 through 20 explains that uh, what God has done for humanity in Christ Paul writes the book of Romans and, and he, he's in the first chapter here, in verses 16 through 20, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God, of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So what we see in, this, in, in Romans here connects back even with Exodus. God has given us the gospel, the, the power of God to redeem us from sin and death, regardless of, of age or gender or race or anything like that. Yet also God's wrath is clearly seen against sin and unrighteousness. But within that wrath is, is shown to the ungodly, the power and might of the Almighty God. And this reveals to them their need for a Savior, their need for a redemption that they cannot buy. So we see how God exercises redemption and judgment throughout Scripture, how the Father exercises these things to accomplish salvation. And to affect our salvation, to make this happen, Colossians tells us this. In Colossians 1, 13 through 14, that, that God has delivered us out of the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we see the Father working to affect salvation for us through both redemption and judgment. And as the redeemed, we ultimately look forward to to this hope of eternity. As we recognize that that the Father reigns now and reigns with the Son, and we look forward to eternity when, when God's kingdom will come in its fullness. And we will be forever with our with our Lord. Hebrews 2 8 is is one other scripture I want to point towards for a moment. Because the last part of, of, our, of our statement talks about how 
God's kingdom will, will come. There's, there's some future tense in there. Hebrews 2.8 tells us this. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Certainly, we know the Father remains in control of, of creation over everything he's created. And yet, for a time, God has allowed evil to remain. The humanity might have a chance to repent and turn to him. But we know that his kingdom is coming in its fullness very soon. And when it does, there will be nothing left that is not fully subjected to the Father and the Son. So scripture shows us, as we've looked at this, I think we can affirm that the Father accomplishes his plan of salvation through both redemption and judgment. We've seen this in scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New. I think we can also equally affirm that all things will be subject to him and his kingdom will have no end. We can clearly see in this the primary roles of the Father to to plan salvation, to exercising redemption and judgment, that he is the ruler of all. But then the question becomes, okay, how does he relate to to Jesus? How does he relate to the Son? So that's where we're going to go next. As we look at the primary roles of the son, let's turn one, one more, uh, once again to our statement and take a quick look at this. It says, The father sent the son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of Mary when she was a virgin. Jesus became fully human while remaining fully God. Anointed by the Spirit, Jesus revealed the father and the kingdom of God by his sinless life, teaching, and miracles. After he died for our sin, God raised him from the dead, and he is now at the right hand of the Father. I want to pause here for a moment. Like we kind of mentioned before, there are going to be a lot of false teaching that tries to get in when we think about Jesus. And it's a little wonder, because if Satan can can mess up our fundamental understanding of who Jesus Christ is. He can grossly distort the gospel message and he can lead people astray. So there's some, unfortunately, there's some religions out there that provide actually false teaching about Jesus. Such as, one of them would be Mormonism that contends that Jesus Christ was was a procreation of the Father. So he didn't always exist in eternity past, but at some point the Father created Jesus. This is what Mormonism puts forward. And they further believe that Jesus, as a completely separate being from the Father or the Spirit, became a God. So again, has not existed for all eternity as God, fully God, but became a God. But this is in direct conflict to our confession that both God is one God in three persons, that neither blending their essence nor dividing it. And it's also in the direct violation of our belief that Jesus Christ has always been God. Similarly, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that, that Jesus, while the Savior, is not anything other than a man. A really nice man, but just a man. How do we contend with those teachings? We need to know our stuff too. So how do we contend with that? Well, the truth, we're going to go back to Scripture. And the truth that we find in Scripture starts with this, that Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man. He is the second person of the Trinity. But I want to start with this again. As we find in Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We need to hold this very closely. We have one God who exists eternally in three equal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ did come to earth, and he was born of the Virgin Mary. But again, another, another unfortunate teaching that arises is the idea that somehow God had sex with Mary or something like that, and, and it distorts entirely the biblical view of what happened and, and the miracle of how Jesus 
came down and, and became incarnate, God in flesh. So we read in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the angel is talking to Mary. He's come to Mary and he says this, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So Jesus Christ, uh, he's, he's therefore conceived by the miraculous agency of the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. The Father's plan to send the Son And the son's submission to the will of the father demonstrate their unity. Yet we need to remember as well that he has been and always will be fully God while becoming fully man. For that, we need to turn to the book of John, the gospel of John. And in the very first chapter, in the very first verse, we read this. In the beginning was the word And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is Jesus. Jesus Christ is fully God, having existed for all eternity, yet God the Son chose to step into human form so that He could make atonement for our sin, so that He could purchase redemption for us. So Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Having all the fullness of God in him, as scripture does tell us, but being incarnate. And this word itself, incarnate, means to be in the flesh. God in the flesh. And the Gospel of Matthew, again, very first chapter, verse 23, we read that Christ is Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Jesus became incarnate, God in flesh, he chose for a time to to set aside some of his divine abilities. And I pray you'll hear me very clearly on this. This does not make him less God. But while he walked on this earth, he chose to limit himself for time. And in doing so, he becomes our ultimate example of what it means to live life empowered by the Holy Spirit and totally dependent on the Spirit of God. Christ lived a Spirit-filled life. We're going to turn again to Luke. In chapter 4, verse 1, we read this. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He's anoint- Jesus was anointed by the Spirit. As we read in the Gospel of John, at his baptism, John the Baptist says this, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and remain on him. So Scripture bears witness to the truth of Christ's anointing by the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ lived a spirit-empowered life. And it's our example of how that works. Moreover, through Jesus, we, we know the Father. And we have seen the Father. And this, is demonstrated, this demonstrates, once again, the unity of our God, our one God. So John 14, 7 through 10, and I know I'm, I'm all over the Bible today, so hopefully you guys are keeping up. Jesus is talking to the disciples. And we encounter their conversation here. This is what Jesus says. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. 
So we see that Jesus, knowing Jesus means that we know the Father as well. It demonstrates their unity as one God. Lastly, we're going to get to this more in in, in later messages, but we see the truth that Scripture proclaims about salvation, which was planned by God the Father and carried out by God the Son. In fact, the gospel message, of course, as we know, is is all about the death and and the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. So the triune God's salvation plan, which, is, which included the sending of God the Son in human form or in human flesh to atone for our sin and make us right with God demonstrates a core fact for us. That God is for us. That God loves us. And for those who place their faith in Jesus, there is eternal hope. That's what we see about God the Son. Some of these primary roles, carrying out the Father's salvation plan, being totally submitted to the will of the Father, even one with the Father. We see Jesus being fully God and yet choosing to become fully man and living and dying and raising again to God's glory and for our salvation. That leads us at last to the Holy Spirit. We, we looked at the Father, we looked at the Son. I pray you've got a, at least a decent handle on, on both of them. I know there's a lot of information there. But now we ask, what, what are the primary roles of the Holy Spirit? Uh, his primary roles are to give life to draw people into repentance, to shape us more into the image of Christ. Scripture calls him our our paraclete, which means helper. He is sent from the Father through the Son to us as believers and disciples of Jesus Christ. So I want to take a look for a moment at at our soul at once again. Our statement says this, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son and gives life throughout creation. The Spirit draws people to repentance and new life in Jesus Christ. Through the Spirit's indwelling, the Father and the Son are present to all believers, making them children of God. So I'd like to be blunt for a moment. Do we actually find this in Scripture? Is this accurate? Well, I think first and foremost, we understand the Spirit proceeding from the Father through the Son. And this is an important point. Acts 2.33 says this, Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He, that would be Jesus, has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So Jesus, having received the promise of the Spirit from the Father, pours the Spirit out upon his disciples. So we see the work that happens at Pentecost as the Spirit comes upon believers in Acts 2.4 is truly the work of the triune God. Christ receives that promise of the Holy Spirit and pours it out upon us. And the amazing thing is that the Holy Spirit gives life not just to us, but, but Scripture demonstrates all creation. We see him present right at the beginning of the creation account, right at the beginning of the Bible, hovering over the waters as creation begins. In Psalm 104, verse 30, we read this, When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. Romans 8.23 tells us that not only the creation, but we ourselves, have, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. 
So we see the Holy Spirit bringing life. Not only to, to us as those who receive the first fruits of the Spirit's work, but we are waiting even for God to complete his work to, to restore all creation. And from this life-giving stance, we also see the Holy Spirit drawing us to repentance. Because we know it's, it's only by God's grace that someone can repent, can have a heart changed, can have a new life in Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God does this work. So John 16, 8 tells us this. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Again, these are Jesus' words. And he's speaking to the disciples because it seems counterintuitive for Jesus to leave his disciples. Why, why would we ever want Jesus to, to leave and go back to heaven? Stay with us here. But Jesus says, no, actually, it's to your benefit. Because when I go, the paraclete, the helper, the Holy Spirit is going to come. And clearly we do see the Holy Spirit doing the convicting work, working life change. And I should take the pressure off us a little bit because, yes, we are supposed to proclaim the gospel message. We are supposed to go, but we recognize that that we're not supposed to save people. The Holy Spirit does that. Our job is, is to testify. And then to get out of the way and let God's Spirit do His work. I mean, yet even within that, we see demonstrated in Scripture that the Spirit is poured out upon us as believers to empower us to testify. I want to draw us back to the book of Acts. In chapter 1, verse 8, we read this. But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We're actually going to get into this in in later uh, messages. But for now, the Holy Spirit empowers us for witness. And this is a key part of the role that the Holy Spirit plays. The reality is, is that for us as believers, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, indwelling us, making known to us the presence of the Father and the Son, working life change, empowering us to share and proclaim the gospel to this world. And we become children of God. 1 John 3, verse 24 says, Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. This shows us, in no uncertain terms, that the Holy Spirit's presence and work is vital to the Christian life. It's vital to our walk with God. We know the presence of the Father and the presence of the Son through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And this should speak to us once again. I I pray it speaks to you about the awesomeness of our one God. Because the Holy Spirit is fully God and therefore brings the full presence of God to us. So I want to point you to one last scripture. That's Romans 8 verse 11. It says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I want to ask you this. How amazing is it that we have the fullness of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us? We don't get a junior version or like a, you know, a half version of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. The same Spirit that that Jesus Christ fully relied upon while he walked the earth is the same Spirit that dwells in each and every one of us as believers in Jesus. 
That's a beautiful gift. That's an honor. Talk about being temples of the living God. Truly, the, God's Spirit lives in us. So I think in the end, we, we can see that the Spirit breathes life to us and all creation because Scripture shows us that. And we also believe that the Spirit does the work to bring people to re- repentance because our Lord told us so. And it's recorded in the Bible. And we see in Scripture how the Father, through the Son, sends the Spirit out and, and the Spirit of God goes forth to each and every believer, young, old, male, female, regardless of race or heritage or anything like that. For anyone who accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes into them, abides with them, and he empowers them to be witnesses as we are commanded to do by Jesus Christ. So, we've looked at the roles of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The main idea is is that salvation, our salvation, is the act of the triune God. We see the Father planning salvation, exercising salvation through redemption and judgment. We see the Father ruling and reigning over all with the Son. We see God the Son, who is fully God, becoming fully human for us. Being totally submitted to the will of the Father. Demonstrating their unity. Coming and being born and living and dying and being raised to life again. As we said, for, for God's glory... And to effect salvation. And through Jesus then we we become transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of Christ. As Colossians told us. And then we also see the Holy Spirit coming. Empowering us as believers. Effecting life change. Effecting even repentance. That is how people's hearts are changed. It's not because we're great. It's because God is great. And we see the Holy Spirit coming and empowering us to witness. We recognize that, that the fullness of God's Spirit dwells in us as believers. And so we know the Father and the Son. And what an amazing, awesome privilege and, and gift that is. So the question then that, that I, that I want to leave with you this morning We've looked at a lot, again, a lot of information. I know there's a lot of theology here. There's a lot of stuff. Um, We packed a lot into 30 minutes. Um, But it, it doesn't really make a difference if we don't understand how this, this affects and impacts our lives, our faith. So what, what do we do with this now? Well, I want to leave you, I want to leave you with a challenge. The challenge for you this week, for all of us, which includes myself, is to go out and to be a witness about your faith to at least one person. And what I'm going to ask you to do is is to, I know that that's going to look different for different people and different things. You can't just walk up to someone and be like, hey, do you know the Lord? Because it's going to turn a few people off. But Maybe it's in conversation, your faith comes up. Or you share your perspective with someone on, I don't know, something that, that demonstrates to them, hey, I know, where, I know where my hope is. It's in Jesus Christ. And you need to know that too. There's a lot of different ways that you can witness about your faith. And it's probably going to be a different story for each one of us. But what we're going to do is, is we're going to ask God in a minute, to bring a circumstance this week or put a, put a person's name on our heart that we can go out and we can witness to. That we can tell them about this, this act of the triune God. About the living presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. About the coming of Jesus Christ to earth to effect salvation for us and how the Father 
planned this from the very beginning. And from that, what I'd like us to do, and I, I am putting it out to each and every one of us, next week when you come back, there's going to be a board and there's going to be some sticky notes by it. And what I'd like you to do is, if you can, write that person's name down. If you can't write that person's name because it's confidential or you don't feel comfortable, that's okay. You could put a friend, a loved one, you know, some sort of descriptor. And we're going to put those notes up on that board and we're going to start praying for those people. We're going to ask the Spirit of God to do that, do that work of drawing them into repentance. Do that work of creating a new heart, a clean heart within them. We can sit here, we can discuss theology, we need to know this stuff, but if it does not affect our, our faith, if it does not grow our faith, and if it does not embolden us to go out and to proclaim the gospel, it's not actually doing that much good. So that's the challenge this week. Go out, witness to one person about your faith. It's going to look different for each of you, and that's okay. Come back. Put that, write their name down. Put that sticky note on the board. As a congregation, we're going to start praying for them. We're going to find a way to, to pray for these people. So now, as, as we take, we're going to take a few moments. We're going to pray. We're going to pray about two things. The first thing we're going to pray about is, is Lord, it's kind of a continuation from last week. Lord, hit me afresh with how amazing you are. Show me again your awesomeness that, that you would save me. And I pray in, as, as you allow your heart to be opened by God, you will see how amazing it is that the triune God worked for our salvation in the ways that we've talked about. The second thing we're going to pray about is we're going to pray over those people the names that we're going to bring back next week. We're going to pray over them now. We're going to ask God to bring us into those circumstances to put somebody's name in our hearts and our minds. But he already knows who they are, so we're going to start praying for them now. So would you join me? Lord, thank you uh, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, that, that your word shows us who you are. God, thank you that that we get to know you and that we're going to get to spend all eternity getting to know you more. You are infinite. We'll never stop learning more about you. But Father, we just, God, we just give you praise. Father, thank you for planning salvation. For effecting salvation through both redemption and judgment, and for your mercy and love, and that you have given the world time to repent. Jesus, thank you for, for coming, for being submitted to the will of the Father, to come and, and to live and to die and to be raised again for your glory for the glory of of God, but for us as well, so that we might be saved. And Holy Spirit, God, thank you that you, you indwell us. Thank you that you've chosen to live within each of us. Holy Spirit, that through you we know the Father and the Son Thank you that we don't get a junior version of you, but we have the fullness of the Spirit of God within us. Lord, you are so good. And so my prayer right now, Holy Spirit, would you fall on us and remind us in a, in a fresh way, convict our hearts about the awesomeness of who you are. Help us to see, Lord, with better clarity how amazing our God is. And Lord, from that, I I pray that our hearts would be stirred. Holy Spirit, we saw in your word today that, that you empower us to witness, to testify. 
And we received a commissioning from Jesus to go forward, to be witnesses even to the ends of the earth. You have given us a mission field here in Leesk and Marsland and, and surrounding area. Lord, the field is, is white, ripe for the harvest. Empower us to be your witnesses. Lord, as we go forward this week, um, the challenge is to, is to witness to at least one person. Lord, I don't know what the circumstances, circumstances surrounding each of those um, times is, is going to be, but you do. And Lord, you know already the people that you're going to place in our path that you're going to ask us to witness to. So Lord, we pray for those people right now. We might not know their name yet, but you do. Draw them to yourself, we pray. God, do saving work. Thank you that you, you can do this, you do do this. And I pray an empowerment upon each and every one here. I pray an empowerment that you would um, help them to be bold as they go. Help them to have spiritual eyes to see when the opportunities are there. God, we just, we give you praise. We give you glory. We thank you. Pray this in your mighty name. Amen.